Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 473rd episode, we've got a bunch of listener questions that we're going to go through, but also we're trying something new called Dinosaurs on Trial. Yes. I would say this is a fully listener-powered segment because one person suggested it in our Discord, and then we had a few listeners that helped figure out the format of this segment. And then, of course, all of the answers came from listeners. So I'm excited. And Sabrina did basically all the work, so I'm going to find out what we're doing. I would say our audience did the work on this one. Dinosaurs on trial. One of us is going to be the judge, and the other one of us is going to take the answers that you, our audience, submitted to defend your favorite dinosaurs. So basically, they're on trial for whether or not they are interesting enough to be someone's favorite? Yes, or if they're too uninteresting. (laughs) Okay. We also have Dinosaur of the Day, Canignasia, and a fun fact, which is coming from our listener questions. It is, yes. But before we get into all that, real quick, we want to thank some of our patrons, because of course... We couldn't make this podcast without our patrons, especially not podcasts which are mostly (laughs) patron questions and patron suggestions for dinosaurs that we should talk about. Uh, This week, we'd like to thank Zoe V. Soros, and I've been mispronouncing that one, leaving out the V in the middle. So the correct pronunciation is Zoe V. Soros. Thank you very much for supporting us. And then also rounding out our random drawing winners, there's Trev, Porter Venator, TRX Dinosaurs, Cameron, Dino Mo, Micah Marcos Music, G Rex, Albertosaurus, and Verociraptor. Awesome. And I know at least some of those patrons submitted listener questions or told us their favorite dinosaurs. So thank you. And thank you also for supporting the show and letting us do fun stuff like this episode. <laughs> We're going to start with Dinosaurs on Trial. Again, this segment came about entirely because of our listeners and especially our Dino It All community, so thank you again. Raptor Yelts, I'm going to give a shout out to, I wrote on our Discord that this sounds like it should be a segment in an episode where one of us has to defend why you like or dislike a dinosaur species. And yes, I saw this idea a while back on the Discord. We liked it so much that we decided to ask for opinions and we got a lot of amazing answers over 30, but I lost count. (laughs) And there are too many to include in this episode, so I think we're going to record them all and then trim them down and release some of them as bonus content. So if you're a patron, check out your bonus content feed for more dinosaurs on trial and Mm. also probably more Q&A because this list and our notes for this episode are like two to three times as long as a typical episode (laughs) yes (laughs) and we don't want to release like a four or five hour long episode so yeah (laughs) bonus content it is yay Mm -hmm. i also want to give a shout out to fellow dino it all wiser who came up with the fun format for responding and we decided to take another community member's suggestion morgan to use it for this segment so thank you again for the wonderful ideas And we're going to take, we, Garrett and I are going to take turns playing the role of judge and incorporate as many answers as we can. Some dinosaurs got multiple votes, so we will be including multiple people's responses. I don't think we'll be reading responses exactly word for word, but we're definitely going to be using them. Okay, Garrett, you will be the judge and I will be defending the dinosaur. Okay. So our first case for the evening or morning, depending on when this is being listened to, is Stegosaurus versus the people. The people (laughs) include four voters, Larissa, Laura, Able Able 2016, and Fedorasaurus. I don't know if it's versus because those are the four people who voted for Stegosaurus. Well, they are accusing it of being weird in a good way and for killing Thag. So, Oh, I see. I should say we... Some people did uh, tell us the specific crimes and other people we just kind of shoehorned into this format because in this particular case, all four votes went to Stegosaurus being the favorite dinosaur. Gotcha. So what is the defense for Stegosaurus? Well, Stegosaurus has always been near the top 
of people's lists. For some, Fantasia was a gateway to dinosaurs. And you know what? We feel sorry for the Stegosaurus and admire its pluck and fight into the last. In other words, getting eaten in Fantasia. Yes. It's a little bit inaccurate in Fantasia because Stegosaurus never went up against Tyrannosaurus. That's a good defense. It couldn't have even been there in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> That's an alibi by tens of millions of years. <laughs> That's true. Although it's not it's not on trial for anything against Tyrannosaurus. <laughs> true. But anyway, it's also got really incredible plates, and there aren't really any modern analogs to that. So it's prime ground for speculation and hypothesis. And of course, there's the favorite ridiculous theory, the butt brain, that is attached to Stegosaurus, that it had a second brain in its butt, which we know is not true, but was fun to think about. Could have been a glycogen body like they have in birds, mm -hmm. as an aside. And, you know, sure, Therizinosaurus and Dinochirus get a lot of attention because they're really weird dinosaurs. But Stegosaurus, we've known about it for so long. So a lot of people might not even realize how weird it is, even for a dinosaur, with its plates and its thagomizers. Although they're innocent because Steggies use their thagomizers for self-defense. So the late, not-so-great thag was a liar and maybe a stalker. <laughs> uh. <laughs> because, of course, that's how the Thagomizer got its name, was because of the Far Side cartoon. Where it killed a caveman named Thag. Mm-hmm. The Stegosaurus, it's an animal unlike other dinosaurs and other creatures in appearance, and those plates and spikes are so cool. So, yes, the answer might not be very deep, but we love Stegosaurus because they're cute. They've got big bodies and little heads. <laughs> okay. So I guess for the, the verdict on Stegosaurus will be a split verdict in that on the count of being weird in a good way, it's guilty because it's got these crazy big plates and all sorts of other weirdness, the Thagomizer. But on the count of killing Thag, it's not guilty because cavemen and dinosaurs did not coexist, so it couldn't have killed it. Mm. And like they said, it was for self-defense anyway. So it's, not, <laughs> it's not seeking out animals to attack with its tail. Yes. It's not really how tail-based weaponry usually works. We've got a lot of cases to cover. Should we move on to the next one? Sure. Got a busy docket in the courtroom today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so number two is Tyrannosaurus rex. It's got three three plaintiffs, <laughs> Dr. Eric Nefarious, Tyrant King, and Sue, and they all accuse T-Rex of being pedestrian or basic and the obvious choice. Look, we know that Tyrannosaurus Rex is kind of pedestrian, but T-Rex has been many people's favorites for such a long time, and it seems like Every new discovery of dinosaurs just makes T-Rex more worthy of the name that Osborne gave it back in 1903. King of the tyrants. Tyrant king, yeah. Tyrant king, yes. And sure, maybe we sound a little basic for liking T-Rex, but you know what? Let's throw something else out there for someone else to defend. What's so great about Torvosaurus? <laughs> a little bit of whataboutism? <laughs> a little bit. And I have some thoughts on that. So, Torvosaurus has two established species, Tannerai and Gurnii. Let's compare that to Tyrannosaurus rex, where there's debate about whether or not there are even two more species. <laughs> Torvosaurus was also found on more continents, North America, South America, Europe, and Africa, compared to just North America for Tyrannosaurus rex. So, Torvosaurus, I would say, was a better traveler. I thought you were defending T-Rex. Yeah, but now I'm defending Torvosaurus because I'm doing I'm doing both parts. <laughs> oh, I see. I know, it's a little confusing. Maybe I should do a different voice. Torvosaurus lived way... No, that doesn't work. I'm going to use the same voice, but I'm defending Torvosaurus now. <laughs> this council is all over the place. <laughs> this is... <laughs> Again, I'm, I'm going by our audience's answers because uh, if you listen to this podcast, you already know what Garrett and my favorite dinosaurs are, and they didn't make the list. <laughs> they don't, I mean, obviously, they know what the verdict would be, mm -hmm. right? So 
That's true. Anyway, back to Torvosaurus. Torvosaurus lived way earlier in the Jurassic compared to the Cretaceous, but it still managed to get really big. It had this large skull and the powerful body, and it's found in places like the Morrison Formation, which was full of sauropods, so it possibly specialized in dismembering some very large sauropod carcasses. Uh, there weren't as many sauropods around during T-Rex's time, so that's a big minus for T-Rex. That's true. T-Rex was not picking on animals its own size for the most part. Yep. Or bigger than its own size. <laughs> so, uh, yes, that's what's so great about Torvosaurus. But back to defending Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> <laughs> it's a favorite. It's in places like the Field Museum, which has one of the largest and one of the most complete skeletons, Sue. And it's such an interesting dinosaur. And we also keep seeing it in media in different ways, which is really cool. Like in Prehistoric Planet, how it was swimming. We are still talking about if it was a scavenger or a hunter and how it used its arms and so much more. And in, of course, it's in pop culture like Jurassic Park. And w let's be honest, pretty much every dinosaur movie features a T-Rex at some point. So it's arguably the most famous and recognizable of dinosaurs. Sure, it might get made fun of for its short arms, like those T-Rex hate push-up jokes, but the tyrant lizard king rules in his hands down t rex <laughs> <laughs> Those are some pretty good defenses. <laughs> I feel like, yeah, I may have mischaracterized the plaintiffs and maybe their co-defendants with T-Rex more than plaintiffs. Mm. But I have to say T-Rex, it is very ubiquitous, which does make it less interesting. Sort of like the most common car that you see, that's T-Rex in terms of dinosaur media. You see it all the time. But it's kind of like if the most common car you saw was also like a monster truck or something, just like the most extreme and outlandish car. It's still extreme and outlandish and very impressive, even if everybody's obsessed with it. Mm -hmm. Everybody's obsessed with it for a reason. Yes. Yeah. There's like we all said before, there's so much to learn from T-Rex and still new discoveries being made. Yeah. It does help that we have a decent sample size of T-Rex so that you can actually do studies on things like bite forests and how they grew up and how they changed as they aged and things like that, where you couldn't really do that with dinosaurs that we have only one specimen of, which might be lesser known because they're less common in the fossil record. But almost every SVP, there is somebody lamenting the fact that Everybody just wants to talk about T-Rex and there's tons of people <laughs> studying T-Rex and everybody's talking about T-Rex, but there's so many other dinosaurs out there. So I do think there's a little bit of it being overrated in terms of the number of scientists focusing on T-Rex versus other dinosaurs. Like some of the other dinosaurs deserve a little more attention and maybe T-Rex doesn't need quite so much focus all the time. Sure. But then dinosaurs like T-Rex are why people get into other dinosaurs and are able to to even get funding to research other dinosaurs. That's true. And we can't in any sort of justifiable position say that we think T-Rex is overrated when we put T-Rex on our logo. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh, we got some bias here. <laughs> yeah, so maybe we can't make a verdict and we need to rescind ourselves from the <laughs> verdict. <laughs> <laughs> Mistrial. Also went off the weeds with the Torvosaurus in the middle. Mm. So up next, we've got Parasaurolophus. This one was requested by Venozoic Crow and Prehistoric Fern. And the crime Parasaurolophus is accused of is honking and disturbing the peace. Look, it's really hard to pick a favorite. And we've learned that they could sing, or well, horn blasts, which makes them even better, but... Sure, it's a hard call these days. There are a lot of other contenders for favorite dinosaur. Still, Parasaurolophus is great because we have a display of them at different museums. And there's the nostalgia factor because we've known about Parasaurolophus for a long time. And they're really fun to draw because of their interestingly shaped skulls. And of course, they go honk. <laughs> we like the honking. Yep. I do like that two out of three of the people who presented Parasaurolophus as their favorites and worthy of a good defense listed a series of other dinosaurs as <laughs> there's also these other dinosaurs which are arguably as cooler cooler. <laughs> yeah, a lot of Therizinosaurus and T-Rex came up. <laughs> 
which doesn't really bolster the defense if you're like my favorite is Paris Rolfes and it's the best. Well, there's also all these other ones that are really cool. <laughs> it just means you like all the dinosaurs. It's, you can't narrow it down. Yeah. We asked a tough question. Yeah, that's true. I think for the crime of honking and disturbing the peace, I would probably say not guilty just because the noise that it makes, I don't think was that loud or obtrusive compared to the noises other dinosaurs and other animals were probably making. Mm. So it was probably a different pitch. But then again, their hearing was probably tuned to that specific pitch, whereas other dinosaurs might not have even been bothered by it. So really, <laughs> do they even have standing to be upset by this noise? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say Parasaurolophus is not guilty on this one, but is a cool dinosaur. Do you have any thoughts on Parasaurolophus? The main thing that we know about it is that it could honk and it had the large crest it is really fun to draw. I recently did an, a sort of art project with a Parasaurolophus skull. Yeah. Which will be coming out. So we'll be making an announcement about that soon. We could just make the announcement now. Oh, okay. I guess so. <laughs> uh, for all of our patrons on the Triceratops level and above, we will be sending out a Parasaurolophus patch. If you liked the Styracosaurus patch from last year, then... We've got good news for you. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Limited edition once again. And we'll have a lot more details about that next year, early next year. And we're going to take a quick recess from our court to do a ad break. But when we come back, we're going to get back into it with Utah Raptor. All right. Next on the docket, we've got Utah Raptor. This one was... Suggested by Keegan and Justin Time 233, and it is accused of being so big or maybe too big for a raptor. Yes. Well, as a lifelong fan of Jurassic Park's raptors, the fact that Utah Raptor was so close to the real animal as the dinosaurs featured in the film is like, hands down, this is the favorite. And it's only gotten better as more information about them has come out. The fact that they were a bulky ambush hunter, that they more likely stood on their prey to pull them apart like eagles and hawks is pretty amazing. And they likely lived in family groups and they were giant murder birds. So, yeah, just really cool. And of course, they're just so ginormous, especially for a dromaeosaur or a raptor. And they've been around for long enough that. There's a nostalgia factor too, either hearing about them in a classroom or, of course, going back to like Jurassic Park. And kind of dovetailing on that, we do have a listener question that has to do with raptor sizes. I don't want to get into the spoilers yet, but just how big could they get? Too big, <laughs> according to <laughs> this claim. Or not big enough. We could have flipped it. <laughs> That's true. So I think for the accusation that Utah Raptor is too big for a raptor, I mean, there is some justification of that because very few raptors got at all close to this scale. Most of them are like turkey sized, mm -hmm. basically smaller, maybe a little bigger. But Utah Raptor was pretty obscenely large <laughs> for a bird like dinosaur. But I guess you can't really say something is too big. Because in the context of its environment, it was the right size. True. So I guess it's another not guilty coming down for Utah <laughs> Raptor. <laughs> <laughs> Up next is Lambiosaurus, suggested by Dragon Feathers. And the crime it's accused of is having an edgy crest. Well, yes. Hadrosaurs in general are the best, and the crest really gives Lambiosaurus its edge. Also got featured in Dinotopia and the drawings of the ceremonial hornblowers with their corresponding lambiosaurs, which is so amazing. Yeah, as a early fan of Dinotopia, I feel like that's also biasing the court. <laughs> 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 so I'm tempted to recuse myself. But since the crime is just for having an edgy crest, it's not high stakes. I don't think there's any recommended sentencing for that one mm. it's like a that's a slap on the wrist kind of if you get convicted so 
I think it's probably guilty, right? It had a really cool crest. I will say, as an aside, that Parasaurolophus definitely has a cooler crest Mm. than Lambiosaurus. You just can't compete with the the largest, the biggest, baddest crest. And that's why we say Hadrosaurs are the best. We do? Not you and me. I'm I'm speaking for... (laughs) <laughs> our, our listeners who voted. Oh, on defensive in your client's yeah. perspective. <laughs> yeah. They are cool. I don't know about the best, but yes. <laughs> cool enough. The next one we've got is Therizinosaurus, suggested by Rich and Tis Just Jake. The crime it's accused of is being confusing and ambiguous. Yes. Therizinosaurus is equally adorable and confusing. (laughs) So we're going to need the court to figure out a verdict. Overall, though, it's the scythe lizard. And it probably had feathers. And it was an herbivorous theropod in a family tree of carnivores. It ate plants. And it had those gigantic claws And there's just so many confusing, weirdly wonderful things about it. Yes, I agree. And I guess if the question here, if I'm working more as a mediator rather than a judge, Mm. and the the question is whether it is cute and cuddly and adorable or terrifying, I'm going with terrifying (laughs) because the animal with the largest claws of any animal in all of Earth's history, as far as we know, just that's a crazy fact that it had the biggest claws of anything ever. Yes. Although it sounds like it couldn't use its claws for too much because it was too big. Yeah. I think you had a paper where you were talking about the the stress on it would be too much and it Mm -hmm. could break a claw or break the bone underneath the claw or something like that. But that assumes that it's actually putting a serious amount of force on it if the claws are really sharp and all they have to do is just poke you with it gently to cause a bunch of damage and they have a whole bunch of extra reach because of those claws that's enough to be intimidating whether or not it actually has to put them to use you know it's like a bee stinger right if the bee stings you and it dies as a result of it that doesn't mean the bee stinger isn't a deterrent. <laughs> true. The same is true with their xenosaur claws, right? Like if it breaks a claw off in defending itself, but kills you in the process, <laughs> impaling you with this like three foot long spear, that it, it's still a good, def- you know, terrifying monster creature. Actually, I think their xenosaurus is one of the few dinosaurs which justifiably could be described as a monster. <laughs> <laughs> But again, it might have looked kind of cute in some ways. I think overall, though, probably terrifying if you were to encounter it face to face. We don't know its behavior. True. Maybe it was cuddly. Maybe it's hard to cuddle with those claws. But yeah, it's possible. I think it's kind of like a hippo. From afar, as a stuffed animal, as a cartoon, it's very cute. In person, horrifying. (laughs) (laughs) And run away. (laughs) So next on trial is Euteranus, keeping the fluffy, big theropods together. This was suggested by Chandler Harar and Jacob, and it's accused of making us realize theropods had feathers. Yes. Do I need to say any more? <laughs> because Euteranus made us rethink if theropods had feathers or not, and in paleo art, It's always got feathers, and it's beautiful. So no matter what anyone says, it will always be a 10 out of 10. (laughs) It's a great specimen, a great fossil. It's one of the first theropod dinosaurs discovered having evidence of feathers. It wasn't the first first, but it was the biggest first. Biggest first, yes. Yes. That makes it an even more exciting find. They found, I believe it was three specimens And that's how we knew its whole body was covered in feathers. It is remarkable. And in the case of Euteranus making us realize theropods had feathers and not just small feathers, not just small dinosaurs, I should say, it's definitely guilty. (laughs) (laughs) There's no question there. It made everyone wonder if Tyrannosaurus rex was covered in feathers. Yes, a debate that still goes on to this day as well as many other large theropods. It basically opened the floodgates of it's not just the small bird-like dinosaurs that had feathers, but also what about something like a Utah raptor we were talking about earlier? It's very hard to say. 
Next on trial, we have Dinochirus, as suggested by Mizu and Jacendus, kind of. Yes. Jacendus, we know you have a different favorite dinosaur, but you also sort of voted for this one. So. <laughs> That's kind of how we go with Dinochirus, too. And it is accused of being so strange. Yes, Dinochirus is such an original. It's like a giant duck with arms, <laughs> some might say. We're just fascinated by the description of its hands. And, you know, there was the big mystery for about 50 years, and we all held hope that one day they'd find the rest of it. And then they did, and it was wonderful nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite headlines were about Dinochirus being the Jar Jar Binks of dinosaurs. Yes. Would have to say it's guilty of being the Jar Jar Binks of dinosaurs. And on top of that, you know, sometimes when people, in terms of damages, right, back to the court, mm -hmm. the amount of time and speculation that was wasted on just finding the arms and thinking that it was this huge, like, T-Rex type animal, but even bigger and with big impressive arms was one of the leading hypotheses. But really, it turned out to be this goofy dinosaur. It's, With a giant gut to process all the plants was probably gassy on top of it. <laughs> it's almost like a hoax perpetrated by itself <laughs> from, you know, like millions of years in the past. Like, I'm just going to get this part of my body preserved and confuse everybody later on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if hoax is the right word, but yeah, it's That's like true. a prank. It is. It felt like a prank. That is exactly <laughs> what it felt like. <laughs> but the truth turned out to be way cooler than just another really large predator mm -hmm. having, just like with Therizinosaurus, that complete strange walking contradiction of big impressive claws on powerful arms with a wide body for eating plants and like short legs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very funny. And hooves. So many interesting features. Next on the docket is Triceratops. Suggested by Buttceratops and PaleoMike716. And it's accused of being a danger to society. Yes. Because even though there are vegetarians who love Triceratops, being able to stab is really cool. <laughs> stab with their head. Stab with the head, yes. And even though Triceratops is a plant eater, it's just as dangerous as any predator. Not unlike a bison or moose. It has both offensive and defensive weapons, and it can counterattack the mighty T-Rex, which, by the way, might be overrated. <laughs> I think we determined it wasn't overrated, although maybe a little, kind of, sometimes. <laughs> I'm just relaying the comments. <laughs> yes. So I think Triceratops is definitely guilty of being a danger to society. As described, those horns on its head were likely used in quite an aggressive way. Maybe mostly against other Triceratops, but that means any specific Triceratops that's on trial is going to be likely a pretty aggro individual mm -hmm. that needs to be contained, kept away from polite society. Well, you think <laughs> about Sarah in Land Before Time. She was the most aggressive dinosaur. She was. It was ahead of its time in that <laughs> analysis. <laughs> And yes, we do think that Triceratops probably poked some holes in T-Rex while T-Rex was also chewing on Triceratops. Mm -hmm. So it could have been as a defensive mechanism there. Yes, in those cases, it's self-defense. But I don't think the big scrape marks on Triceratops frills from other Triceratops could be described as self-defense because, mm -hmm. as we were saying, they are herbivorous, so there's no reason for them to be budding horns other than just pure aggression and being a danger to society <laughs> as they are accused. Next on trial, we've got Velociraptor by Richard and Weiser, and it's accused of being too cool, but also stealing identities. Some paleo identity theft going on here, allegedly. To uh, argue both for and against Velociraptor as a favorite dinosaur. So first, yes, it was in Jurassic Park. And sure, in real life, it was smaller. But it still has the cool factor. Because it was an effective predator in its own niche. 
And we have so much information on Velociraptor compared to a lot of other dinosaurs. There's evidence of it fighting. There's evidence of feathers. Like it's part of the fighting dinosaurs, which is one of the most famous fossils of all. And the name Velociraptor just sounds good, too. That's why Michael Crichton used it instead of calling it Deinonychus. <laughs> it's true. And there was that book about how Deinonychus would maybe get synonymized with Velociraptor. Yes. On the other hand, with the fighting dinosaurs, is that voluntary manslaughter of a protoceratops? Also, with Deinonychus, is it just stealing the identity of its relative? Well, yes, Velociraptor is a household name, but why? That's It's all because of Michael Crichton. The real one is just an unimpressive opportunistic feeder in some desert wasteland, which was always happily confirmed by some people back in the day. We're happy that there's one Velociraptor that got instant karma and the protoceratops that it stabbed fell down on top of it. But sure, yeah, Velociraptors got feathers and they're fluffy. But you know who's also an opportunistic feeder with feathers? Seagulls. And those are not cool either. And Velociraptor can't even fly. Utterly useless animal. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that it did seem to lose that fight to a protoceratops is pretty funny. Although, like we were saying, ceratopsians, pretty intense aggression going on a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. So you can't really be sure which one started the fight. We just have this <laughs> fossilized mid-battle point in time. So it's hard to say whether or not it should be accused of manslaughter, which is why it's not even on the docket for accusations. In terms of stealing identities, that's Michael Crichton. That wasn't Velociraptor that's <laughs> guilty of that. I was going to ask for a mistrial on this one because I'm arguing literally both sides. <laughs> You're arguing both sides and asking for a mistrial against yourself? <laughs> okay, <laughs> guess we'll grant it. <laughs> and in just a moment, we'll get into our listener questions. But first, we're going to pause for a quick sponsor break. All right, kicking off the listener questions. Starting off with a doozy. A <laughs> doozy? <laughs> Which is, is Triceratops still Triceratops or is it Juvenile Taurosaurus? Has it been confirmed yet either way? This was a question by Seth. Thank you very much. Always happy to give an update on this one. The last update was episode 452, not too long ago, but there is an update to make. But first... I want to do a quick recap on it. So Taurosaurus is the quote-unquote perforated lizard, which looks like a larger Triceratops, except that it has holes in its frill. Fortunately for Triceratops fans, though, Triceratops will never be a quote-unquote juvenile Taurosaurus. If anything, Taurosaurus will be a quote-unquote adult Triceratops. That's because Triceratops was named in 1889 by O.C. Marsh, and then he also named Taurosaurus two years later. Since the earlier one gets naming priority, that means that Triceratops will never be replaced by Taurosaurus. It could potentially get replaced by some other previously named dinosaur, but considering like Ceratops is considered invalid, there aren't really any contenders to take Triceratops as a name away. Mm -hmm. So don't worry, because we know it's at least some people's favorite dinosaur. Yes. And at this point, Triceratops has been used so much for so long, I think they might even do a little sneaky, we're going to keep using Triceratops anyway, <laughs> even if there's some tooth or something that was named before it that turns out to be unequivocally Triceratops that nobody noticed for 150 years. So jumping way ahead of time, in 2009, John Scanella and Jack Horner argued that Taurosaurus was a growth stage of Triceratops, specifically that Taurosaurus was actually just the largest and most adult version of Triceratops. Jack Horner was the curator of the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana at that point. And when we first visited the museum in 2016, there were no Taurosaurus, in quotes, on display. There was just an adult Triceratops with holes in its frill, mm -hmm. which other people would have considered Taurosaurus. As far as we know, it's still labeled as an adult Triceratops skull. It certainly was a few months ago, 
when one of our listeners shared a picture with us of it still labeled <laughs> yep. Triceratops. And Longrich and Field argued in 2012 that the holotype of Taurosaurus itself is a juvenile in the paper Taurosaurus is not Triceratops, dot, dot, dot. So obviously this was met with some skepticism almost immediately because in 2009, it was proposed that Taurosaurus was just an adult Triceratops. And by 2012, people are saying, no, Taurosaurus is not Triceratops. Most of that argument on it not being Triceratops is because the Taurosaurus holotype doesn't have completely fused skull bones that are typical of adults. However, that explanation that it's a juvenile isn't perfect since it's one of the largest Taurosaurus individuals, which is pretty strange for it to be a juvenile. Mm -hmm. And it's also hard to see whether or not the bones are fused and just how fused they are because there's a lot of plaster on that specimen filling in gaps. So it's hard to see. And they also didn't do any histology to try to determine the age of the bones. Oh, maybe that's the next step. It is. That's going to be the update in a minute. But first, <laughs> <laughs> oops. back in episode 452, we covered a paper from March of 2022 by Malin et al., and they said, quote, we apply for the first time osteohistological sampling to some postcranial material associated with one of the frills and find the animal was still growing at the time of death. This finding, in addition to other considerations presented here, leads us to conclude that Taurosaurus is a valid genus and is not simply a mature growth form of Triceratops, end quote. Should have remembered that. <laughs> Maybe you did because you sort of mentioned it. So in other words, they found it was a quote-unquote late subadult. So it was still growing a little bit, although it was nearly an adult. Now there is a new paper by Jimmy DeRuige on the subject, and technically the paper is published online, but officially it's going to come out in February of 2024 in Cretaceous Research. They sought out to measure as many Triceratops bones histologically as possible and analyze how they grew, look for any sort of growth signs, if there's any indication that they are slowing down, if they are pure, fully grown adults, in which case it would be strange that Taurosaurus was the last growth stage. And what they found was that a couple of the Triceratops process bones looked more mature than the 2022 Taurosaurus, which hmm. was found to be still growing. Mm -hmm. The plot thickens. Mm -hmm. However, they also said that the data set was too small to determine if Taurosaurus and Triceratops are separate genera or not. So these researchers added a good set of data and it will lead us closer to determining whether or not they are in fact the same genus or not. So it's a stepping stone. Yes, like all good science, it is a stepping stone. But we don't have a consensus yet at this point. I will say, though, in general, most people consider Taurosaurus and Triceratops to be separate genera. There are a lot of publications referring to Taurosaurus, although some of them do list Taurosaurus in quotes, mm -hmm. which is what people do when they're like, that's not really a genus, but we all know what Taurosaurus means, <laughs> which animal we're talking about or which specimens. So you put it in quotes so that everybody knows what you're talking about. This most recent paper, though, didn't use the quotes, just for the record. So they've drawn a line in the sand, maybe. No, not really, because they specifically said they don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, they're leaving it open yes. for further research. Yes. Well, thank you, Seth, for that question. Yep. So long story short of the question of has it been confirmed yet either way, the answer is no. Not yet leaning towards their separate genus or genera. Our next question is slightly less of a doozy. It's do you consider Silosaurs to be dinosaurs, e.g. see Norman et al. 2022 and Mueller and Garcia 2020, etc. from Paul. And I will say since Silosaurid or Silosauridae was named in 2010, They've mostly been considered close relatives of dinosaurs, but not true dinosaurs. See, I considered this question to be more of a doozy than the <laughs> Taurosaurus one. Well, there aren't any new papers that I had to get into with okay. this one, which made it a little bit less of a doozy. And 
also, so Silosaurs are usually called dinosaur formies or dinosaur forms or dinosaur morphs, meaning that they're in a group really close to dinosauria, but just outside of it, just slightly higher up the evolutionary family tree, not quite true dinosaurs yet. Of course, a couple of papers, like Paul mentioned, recently have proposed that Silosaurs are dinosaurs. In that case, they would probably be Ornithischians. And it is a really satisfying hypothesis because it helps to fill in this really big gap in the Triassic of Ornithischia, because basically we have Ornithischians from the very early Jurassic. Mm -hmm. We have the first dinosaurs and dinosaur morphs from like 240 million years ago in the Triassic, and we don't have any Ornithischians for 40 million years at the end of the Triassic. Yeah, just where were they? <laughs> exactly, where were they? Because if the proposal that Ornithischia is one branch and Saurischia is the other branch, there should be Ornithischians running around in the Triassic. We have lots of Saurischians, theropods running around. We even have some sauropods in Saurischia in the Triassic, or I should say sauropodomorphs, but we don't have any Ornithischians. So if Silosaurs were in that basal position in Ornithischia, that would solve that problem because the answer would be, well, the Ornithischians in the Triassic were Silosaurs. <laughs> It would also make the name Silosauridae paraphyletic because it would be technically just this early group of Ornithischians. So people might stop saying Silosauridae and they would just start saying either Silosaurs, which is what some people say because it sounds a little bit less formal, or just say basal Ornithischians. That's a mouthful. Yeah. So personally, because this is sort of a question of what we consider to be silosaurs or whether we consider silosaurs to be dinosaurs, I personally think it's really unlikely that of all the Triassic animals we've found in that 200 to 240 million year old period, that none of them are the ancestors of Ornithischians. I think something in that range that we've found fits in that missing space. And silosaurids being early Ornithischians would solve that problem pretty neatly. But there's another option, and that's Ornithoscolida, which is where early theropods evolved into Ornithischians. And then so the answer of where were the Ornithischians in the Triassic, the answer would be, well, they were theropods. And then the theropods evolved into Ornithischians in the Jurassic, which is a little weirder and I think is sort of leaving favor partly because the main author on Ornithoscolida published a paper on Silosaurs <laughs> being <laughs> the first Ornithischians. So it seems like they're sort of switching gears there. One really good point in favor of Silosaurs being the earliest Ornithischians is that they have a predentary bone at the very front of their mouth that looks a lot like the bone in Ornithischians, which is a unique characteristic of Ornithischians. However, their posture is not at all what we're used to seeing for early dinosaurs because they have very long arms and were likely quadrupedal. Also, some of them were herbivorous, which is weird because we always think of all the early dinosaurs as being carnivorous. Although Ornithischians, a lot of them are herbivorous, so that sort of works out. Mm -hmm. So in the end, for the purposes of our show, we're treating Silosaurs as dinosaurs. There was a new Silosaur named in 2023, and we decided to cover it in the news as a dinosaur, and that was a Monosaurus, which means rain lizard after the Carnian pluvial event. I like that name. Yes. I also like that there's now something we're considering to be probably an Ornithischian that was around during the Carnian pluvial event, which was so long before any previous Ornithischian studies we had talked about. But we don't have a lot of great Silosaur material to work with, so it's a classic need more fossils situation to really nail this down. But for now, we'll keep treating them as dinosaurs and we'll probably keep covering them even if they are solidly placed outside of dinosauria but within dinosaur morpha because that difference is pretty arbitrary and I think they're close enough relatives that it's worth covering them. Next up, another doozy of a question. This one was from Keegan. Do you think there is a limit to the size of dromaeosaurs? I hinted at this one in our Dinosaurs on Trial. We know they got tiny, but could there be a T-Rex-sized raptor? And this is probably not the most popular answer, but it's hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> dromaeosaurs. 
They're known as raptors. They were usually small to medium-sized carnivorous dinosaurs covered in feathers. They're known for their long, rigid tails and, of course, those large sickle claws on their feet. If you think of Velociraptor, that's one of the most famous ones. Now, on the one hand, raptors had hollow bones, and that would help with larger sizes. Utah raptor, as we know, or as we've discussed, is the largest known raptor, or dromaeosaur, estimated to be about 16 to 18 feet long, or 4.9 to 5.5 meters long, and weighing 620 to 660 pounds, or 280 to 300 kilograms. And Utah raptor was a dense dinosaur. When you say dense, you mean it had a lot of muscle, right? Because you were just saying it had hollow bones. (laughs) Oh, yes. Raptors had hollow bones. Utah raptor is one of the more robust raptors, though. Stocky. Yes. Good point. There's also a kilobator, which is another large raptor, estimated to be between 13 and 16 feet, or three and a half to five meters long, and weighing about 364 to 551 pounds, or 165 to 250 kilograms. It's a little smaller than Utah raptor, but still very large. And there's Australraptor, which is estimated to be about 16 to 20 feet, or 15 to 16 meters long, and weigh anywhere between 200 to 661 pounds, or 91 to 300 kilograms. Now, as for if raptors grew bigger, there is a study from February of 2023. And as a side note, I do want to do a more in-depth episode on dinosaur sizes at some point. This study was about the evolution of theropod body sizes. It was published in Science by Michael Demick and others. The theory had been that large dinosaurs grew quickly And for this study, they measured about 500 growth rings in 80 theropod bones. They found that some dinosaurs, some large dinosaurs, grew slowly, even slower than alligators today. And some smaller dinosaurs grew fast, which is obviously different from the theory. So they found that there was no relationship between body mass and maximum annual growth rate. For the raptors or dromaeosaurs, they said, quote, there is a consistent decrease in maximum annual growth rate along the stem of the phylogeny on the line toward birds, end quote. And they said, quote, this steady decrease parallels to the trend of sustained miniaturization along the stem to birds, end quote. That makes sense to me because birds tend to be on the smaller side compared to the non-avian dinosaurs. And dromaeosaurs are closely related to birds. Dromaeosaurs are included in the group paraves, which do include birds. So if you're looking at it that way, well, maybe they didn't get much bigger than Utah Raptor because in general they were trending downward. Mm. But I will say, even though Utah Raptor lived in the early Cretaceous and Achillobatar in the late Cretaceous and Achillobatar was slightly smaller, so that seems to go along that trend there, Australraptor lived later in the Cretaceous about 17 million years or so later than Achillobator, and it was bigger, bigger than Achillobator. So maybe there were some other bigger raptors, and we just haven't found them yet. Maybe. A paleontologist in 2004 found teeth on the Isle of Wight that date from the early Cretaceous that they believe belong to a raptor similar in size to Utah raptor, but since only teeth have been found, it could also be a smaller raptor with just really large teeth. That is a good point, though, because even if we haven't found the body fossils, teeth are pretty easy to find, like how we get spinosaur teeth from all over the place. Mm -hmm. And if somebody found a huge tooth that was like T-Rex sized, but had the dromaeosaur like denticles on it and maybe wasn't quite as banana shaped, that would be news. Mm -hmm. People would know about those teeth and would be saying, where is this huge dromaeosaur? We're seeing its teeth all over the place. Yeah. So unless it turns out that its teeth just ended up converging on what a tyrannosaur tooth looked like, which seems kind of unlikely, then it's weird that we wouldn't have seen it in the fossil record at this point. But who knows? Maybe there's like a Zool type raptor out there that's deeply buried and we just haven't had a chance to come across it yet. (laughs) Yeah. Or like you were saying with Australaptor, which was sort of on its own little spot, on its Mm -hmm. own island, essentially developing. 
you could have something similar happening with a Dromaeosaur somewhere with some island gigantism. Yeah. <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> On the other hand, just kind of counteracting my own point, raptors with their killing claws and they have that distinct body plan could be that they filled a really specific niche. So maybe it wouldn't have been advantageous to grow any larger than Utah Raptor, unless, like you were saying, Garrett, it's in an extreme circumstance yeah. on an island or something. But in Utah Raptor's day, Utah Raptor lived alongside some medium-sized iguanodonts like Hippodraco and some smaller theropods like Ned Colbertia. Some of those specimens found grew up to only almost 10 feet or 3 meters long the theropods, and there was also the herbivorous Therizinosauroid, Martha raptor, the Nodosaurid, Gastonia, and sauropods, Cedrosaurus, and Moabasaurus. It's possible Utah raptor went after sauropods, so then being on the larger side would have helped. It's thought to have been faster than sauropods and move at a similar speed to iguanodonts. And it had, Utah raptor had thick tibia, so it probably had powerful legs and could kick prey as part of its strategy. So maybe that's just as large as it needed to get. Yeah. Yeah, certainly if they got bigger, they would be feeling a very different ecological niche. So just like with Tyrannosaurids, if we hadn't found T-Rex yet, and we were looking at things like Eutyrannus, and we're like, how big could they get? Could they get as big as Giganotosaurus <laughs> or mm. Spinosaurus? You wouldn't necessarily think, oh yeah, they would have kept growing their arms would have kept shrinking and they would have been able to put on all this mass their head would have gotten huge but that is what happened and certainly if a dromaeosaur was in the right conditions it could have undergone some of these things it might have needed to change its leg proportions a little bit because they are sort of built for speed more than anything whereas t-rex is pretty well built for speed but not compared to a dromaeosaur their mm -hmm. their legs are in different proportions and the bones are really packed together for strength, which they kind of are in Dromaeosaurus too, but they're a lot more slender. So there would have to be some pretty major changes there. I just had another thought too. Dromaeosaurs, raptors are known for the killing claw and using that claw to help them in a lot of situations. But if they got so big, would that not be as helpful because maybe they'd be off balance trying to use that killing claw? Maybe. But it, it could still be that they could use their mouth or their bulk or something mm -hmm. when fighting, and then they could use the killing claws like the final death blow kind of thing. True. So it's it wouldn't be a disadvantage, although that is a good point talking about the killing claw. They only have two toes on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is a disadvantage because three toes is a lot more stable as you get bigger and heavier like sauropods four or five toes mm -hmm. you start to see and they start to sort of mesh together into a, a larger footprint like the tyrannosaurus they have which are presumed to be like tyrannosaur or some other really large theropod track they have a pretty big sort of central point where the mass hits the ground and the toes are pretty wide so having just two toes could be a pretty big disadvantage. They might have to, if they did evolve to be that big and heavy, either evolve much bigger toes for those two toes or lose that killing claw, like you were saying. And maybe it wouldn't be that useful at that size anyway. Yeah. But then is it even a raptor at that point? I mean, it is because technically, right, it's based on its ancestors. <laughs> I know. But it wouldn't look... It would look different. Yeah, it probably wouldn't look like a giant Utah raptor would look significantly different. There's also a decent chance it wouldn't have like the same kind of wings and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Maybe not feathers. On that same line of thinking of what dinosaurs could possibly exist, we had a question from Sam. Do you think there's the possibility of a genus of Therizinosaur in the Hell Creek? And I would say absolutely, just I, like... <laughs> I hope so. Anything is really possible in evolution. But Therizinosaurus, for the record, was in Asia essentially during the Hell Creek formation. So if Therizinosaurus could be in Asia... Mm -hmm. It's the right time. Yeah, it was like around 70 million years ago, a little, maybe a little bit before 68 million years ago, a little bit before the Hell Creek formation, but close. If it was somewhere in the world, there's a chance that some of them made it over to the Hell Creek. So that's just one simple answer there. 
But we also know that other dinosaurs made it from Asia to North America around then, or in the tens of millions of years before then. We've got Nothronychus, which was in North America in the late Cretaceous about 92 million years ago, which is still over 20 million years before the Hell Creek Formation. But we find dinosaurs that pop up after gaps of 20 million years all the time. Mm -hmm. So that wouldn't be surprising. Therizinosaurus also aren't super common just in general in the fossil record. It took until 2001 for the first North American Therizinosaur to be found, and it was named Nothronychus mckinleyi, found in New Mexico. In 2009, which is eight years later, we got Nothronychus graphami from Utah. And then in 2012, we got Martha Raptor, the one you just mentioned, mm -hmm. also in Utah, but this one lived about 40 million years earlier. So there's a 40 million year gap where it's like, surprise, there's a Therizinosaur. No one expected this to pop up. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be surprising at all if we found a Therizinosaur that went 20 million years the other way on this time scale. However, the Hell Creek is one of the best explored areas for dinosaur paleontology. So it would be a little bit surprising in that people are looking for dinosaurs there all the time and haven't seen anything. But we do still find new things regularly in the Hell Creek. It's not like we found everything there is to find there. As the soil erodes away, new stuff pops out all the time, and also including new dinosaurs. I would definitely argue, though, that Therizinosaurs weren't common in the Hell Creek, at least not in areas that fossilize readily, because we spend so much time, or paleontologists spend so much time in the Hell Creek looking for dinosaurs, and we haven't seen any Therizinosaur fossils, and we know what to look for now. We know what a Therizinosaur vertebra, for example, looks like, mm -hmm. or more aptly, what their claws look like. I was just about to say, <laughs> yeah, you go for the claws with Therizinosaurs. Yeah. They're not all those really long scythe meter long, three foot long things, they tend to be a lot shorter mm -hmm. and have a specific characteristic curve and bumps on them, but it's still easy to identify. There was also a recent article Sabrina covered that used machine learning and the authors think that they found evidence of a Therizinosaur from the teeth found in the UK in the middle Jurassic, which was a good 20 million years before the oldest known Therizinosauroids. So that could be evidence of even older Therizinosaurs in a place where we haven't really seen them. Yeah, teeth really shed light on things. Because <laughs> shed teeth. Oh, I see. I was like, you're using your pun voice, but I don't see <laughs> the pun. Yes, they do, for sure. Although I don't think Therizinosaurs had that many teeth, especially the really derived ones in the late Cretaceous which could be another reason we haven't found much of what they had in those areas. So yeah, it's definitely possible there was one in the Hell Creek. Also, things in forests often don't fossilize all that well. If it was the kind of animal that spent most of its time in the forest, maybe we just won't find a fossil of it, or maybe it'll be a really long time because some areas just aren't ripe for fossilization. Stuff that hung out on beaches all the time mm -hmm. or in the water, you find fossilized way more often than stuff that's in arid environments or in forests. But we can hope. Mm -hmm. Our next question is from Lisa. Did non-avian dinosaurs lay soft-shelled eggs like today's turtles or hard-shelled eggs like today's birds? Which is a great question. Although I may not have the most popular answer because the answer is that some dinosaurs laid soft-shelled eggs, and some laid hard-shelled eggs. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is, it depends. Yes, depends on the dinosaur. Hard-shelled eggs, they have hard, heavily calcified shells. It's calcium carbonate. And soft-shelled eggs have much less, if any, calcite, but they do have an extra thick membrane. For a long time, we all thought that dinosaurs only laid hard-shelled eggs. A good number of dinosaur eggs have been found, from theropods, hadrosaurs, and advanced sauropods. And then in 2020, there was a study by Mark Norrell and others published in Nature called The First Dinosaur Egg Was Soft. <laughs> we did talk about it in episode 292 when it first came out. And they found that some early dinosaur eggs had soft, leathery shells like turtles. They studied the eggs of protoceratops. 
that one keeps coming up. It's that small ceratopsian with the frill and beak that got in a tussle. At least one of them did with the velociraptor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they also looked at the eggs of Musaurus, which is a sauropodomorph that walked on all fours when it first hatched. And then as it grew up, it switched to two legs. Both of these eggs, some of them had embryos in them, so they knew which dinosaurs the eggs belonged to. Very, very helpful because, yeah. and maybe one of the only ways that we know for sure with ichnofossils, well, trace fossils, which eggs can be if there's no embryos in them. Yep. And trace fossils, it's really hard to know what animal left behind that trace. <laughs> yep. Because otherwise you find a soft shelled egg and who knows if it was from a dinosaur, mm -hmm. unless there's a dinosaur in it. Or maybe you know it's a dinosaur based on like the egg shell, but you don't know which dinosaur. Yeah. That's another good example of preservation bias too, because the hard shelled eggs preserve better. And so we found a bunch of hard shelled eggs and thought, oh, dinosaurs had hard shelled eggs. Look at all these hard shelled eggs we find everywhere. Yes. But you don't know what isn't fossilizing. So for the study, they looked at the mineral and chemical compositions of the eggs and they found that they had a chemical residue that was non-mineralized, so the eggs were likely leathery, like modern turtle eggs. Since these are early dinosaurs, that helps show that hard shell eggs, like we see in the ornithischians, the sauropods, later sauropods, and theropods, they evolved independently at least three times. Mm. Now, that's not the only time that leathery eggs have been found, because earlier in 2023, Feng Luhan and others described a new sauropodomorph in National Science Review named Qianlong. We talked about this one in episode 465, and they found skeletons with egg clutches, and some of those eggs had embryos inside. Again, thank you, that's helpful. Hmm. <laughs> the eggshells were thin, and they had a rough surface and irregular shape that made them look leathery. Yep. So the answer is it depends. Mm -hmm. And I'm still holding out hope that we're going to find a dinosaur that has a fetus inside it. And we'll find out that some dinosaurs gave live birth. Ooh, that would be interesting and big news. It would be so cool. And it wouldn't be surprising because viviparity or giving live birth does evolve frequently in lots of lineages. For example, in sharks, there are sharks that lay, lay hard shelled eggs. There are sharks that lay soft shelled eggs and there are sharks that give live birth and that's all just today that's not <laughs> over a 140 million year time period mm -hmm. so i i feel like there's a very good chance that someday we'll find a dinosaur that gave live birth and it's going to be super cool that would be amazing and it's going to have a really cool latin name like live birther <laughs> <laughs> it'll be better than that it'll, yeah <laughs> it'll sound nicer than that <laughs> Thank you for all of your questions and for the dinosaurs on trial segment. That was a lot of fun to uh, reenact and also to research the questions. Yes. And thanks to all our patrons and other listeners who submitted all those questions. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Canignasia, which was a request from Tyrant King via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. It was a Canignathid oviraptorosaur theropod that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Uzbekistan, found in the Bisekti Formation. Canignasia is not to be confused with Canignathus. We covered that one back in episode 417. As an oviraptorosaur, Canignasia would have had feathers, a beak, a long neck, and long limbs. Give a sort of overall ostrichy type vibe. Yes. But the fossils found of this dinosaur only include jaw bones, vertebrae, and a femur. Based on the pieces of jaw found, the skull is estimated to be about 3 inches or 7.6 centimeters long. So it's estimated to be a small dinosaur at about 2 feet or 0.61 meters long and weigh 3 pounds or 1.4 kilograms. The type species is Canignasia martinsoni. It was named and described by Phil Curry and others in 1994, and the genus name means recent jaw from Asia. Recent jaw from Asia. Yes. <laughs> it refers to it being a Canignathid and being found in Asia. And the species name is in honor of Gerbert Martinson. The holotype includes the lower jaws, 
Two specimens were found at first. Both of those are adults. One specimen was found in a layer around 90 million years old, which makes it the oldest known caning nathid. Then more fossils were found later in expeditions between 1997 and 2006 from the same area where the holotype was found, and one specimen may be an immature individual. Hmm. I'm also surprised they named it Recent Jaw from Asia if it's one of the oldest <laughs> known Cenonathids or Canonathids. I think Canonathid just means Recent Jaw. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Good point. Guess in the grand scheme of dinosaurs, they are recent. Yes, but they were just keeping it part of that group. <laughs> In terms of more fossils found that included another dentary bone, a lower jaw, and some disassociated postcranial bones, some bones from the skeleton, like vertebrae, part of a femur, and more, they assigned the disassociated bones to Canathnasia because it's the only known oviraptorosaurian from the Basecti formation. There's also an unnamed specimen from Kazakhstan. That was described in 1988 and might also be Canathnasia. In 2015, Yao Xi and others described a partial pair of fused lower jaws from the Irene Dabasu formation that they referred to Canathnasia. It was found in a 2012 expedition. So now there are four known dentaries. The newest find helps show that Canathnasia lived in a larger, more wide-ranging area than previously thought, and it lasted longer. Because this youngest specimen shows it lasted about 10 million years. That was a very long time. Yes. Now, in the paper, they said the specimen was more likely a new species of Canathnasia, but, quote, given the limited nature of the material, however, we refrain from formally erecting a new species, end quote. Much appreciated. <laughs> Wait till you find something better. Yep. But they're probably right because 10 million years is a very long time for a species. Yeah, usually it's about 2 million years. They said that finding more complete specimens may help shed light on the potential new species. Uh, either way, this shows that Canathnasia lasted at least 10 million years, quote, representing one of the longest lived theropod genera. Or at least a group that didn't change too much over that long period of time. Mm-hmm. Now, based on its jaws, Canathnasia likely ate eggs in addition to other food. Going back to the oviraptor <laughs> mm. type of thinking. Oh, yeah. Uh, other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place as Canathnasia include the Ceratopsian Tyrannoceratops, the Ankylosaur Bisectopelta, theropods like the Alvarosaur Jaronix, the Dromaeosaur Idomerus, the Tyrannosauroid Timurlengia, and sauropods, as well as enantiornithines. And other animals that lived around the same time and place included turtles, mollusks, fish, plesiosaurs, mammals, pterosaurs, lizards, crocodilomorphs, and amphibians. And our fun fact of the day is actually a listener question, which is, what is your favorite fun fact that you found? Thanks to Sam Azam Sam. And I will say... Neither of them are particularly groundbreaking. It's not like some really deep rabbit hole I went down or Richter Dromius Burrow I went down. My favorite, I think, is that the term Thagomizer originated as a far side cartoon by Gary Larson. That's just such a fun fact. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the funnest fun facts. For the record, there was a 1982 comic. Oh, wow, that's almost... That's over 40 years ago now. Well, we kind of talked about this when we were defending Steggy. Yes. Yeah. And his murder of Thag. Mm -hmm. So that's because the cartoon shows a caveman basically pointing out the tail end of a Stegosaurus and saying, now this is called the Thagomizer, pointing to the spikes at the end of the tail. And then it says, after the late Thag Simmons. <laughs> <laughs> so presumably... Thag Simmons was killed by the Thagomizer, and thus now it is known as the Thagomizer. Uh, we said Stegosaurus was innocent there. Self-defense. Could be, yeah. But again, people did not coexist with Stegosaurus, so it, it's just a cartoon. And if scientists and paleontologists were less good at taking jokes, they would have just been annoyed by this and said, that's not what we call it. We call them, you know, elongate pointed osteoderms at the end of a tail 
<laughs> or perhaps <laughs> horn-like osteoderms or something like that. But instead, according to new scientists, the term was picked up not too long after that cartoon. For example, the paleontologist Ken Carpenter gave a presentation in SVP in 1993 about stegosaur tails, and he described it as a thagomizer, and the name has basically caught on. You don't really see it in peer review publications much. I think it does occasionally show up because you you just call it like the tail weapon. But yes, I love that you can call it a thagomizer in a paleontological circle and no one will bat an eye even though it came from a cartoon. It's fantastic. My other favorite fun fact is that we are closer in time to when T-Rex lived than T-Rex was to Stegosaurus. That's my favorite fun fact. It is such a great way to demonstrate not only how long dinosaurs thrived for, but also the fact that dinosaurs did not all live with one another and just how, you know, humans are just not that large of a part of Earth's history at this point. Another way that I sometimes put it is every Stegosaurus fossil we dig up was already a fossil by the time T-Rex was walking around. In fact, it was already a fossil tens of millions of years before T-Rex was walking around. And the another side fun fact of that is that Stegosaurus isn't even that early for a dinosaur. Mm-hmm. It's pretty late, actually, overall, because it's the late Jurassic by the time Stegosaurus was around. There were dinosaurs 80 million years before Stegosaurus. So there's a whole nother chunk of time, you know, equal in time, basically. You've got Stegosaurus, you've got T-Rex, and then before that you get Stegosaurus. And you can go back to some of these early dinosaur or dinosaur morphs like Saturnalia or Silosaurids or maybe even Platyosaurus on the earlier end of the estimates, and you get like another whole chunk of human time to T-Rex ago. So yeah, I love that. Pretty epic. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thank you so much. We can do episodes like this one because of our community support. And if you want to be a part of that community, Check us out, patreon.com slash inodino. Stay tuned. Next week, we will be doing a best of episode, the best dinosaur news from 2023 to wrap up the end of this year. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.